Hey folks, well, I think this time what I want to get into is talking about structs in C++. Um, in the near future we'll get into talking about classes, but for now we'll focus on a, well, not technically a simpler beast, but, uh, but what we'll treat as a simpler beast. So the idea is we've looked at arrays as a way to hold together multiple items of the same data type, but we don't have a way to group together things that are of different data types. So that's what we want to get into next. Um, I am going to put in a little disclaimer here first. Technically in C++, the only real difference between a struct and a class is that structs treat things as uh, public rather than private. And classes, it's the other way around. By default, a class treats things as private rather than public. So technically, there's very little difference from our point of view between a struct and a class. In practice, they tend to be applied much differently. When we're just looking for a simple container, just a way to group together a few different pieces of data, we'll tend to use a struct. And when we want to associate other operations with that, uh, kind of creating a more complex data type, then we'll use a class. So everything that I'm going to do in this session is focusing on the use of structs in the, the conventional simple container sense. So just that disclaimer, and again, we'll talk about classes in the fairly near future, I hope. All right. So in terms of actually playing with these things, again, the idea is that we want our struct to act as a container, a way to group together multiple different kinds of data, or well, potentially different kinds of data, into a single logical entity, much the same way as an array group together a whole bunch of things of the same data type. So what we'll do in this case is instead of referring to things by positions in an array, what we'll do is in the struct, we'll give a name to each different kind of logical piece of data we want to associate in the group. So let's say that I wanted to create this single logical item that represented a student record, for instance. Then things I want might want to represent about a student might include their GPA, their student number, their name, their email address, that kind of thing. So I would put, I would create this struct, this, this new entity that had a field for the student name that had a field for the student email address, that had a field for the student number. And each of these could potentially be of different data types. And then in the future, I'd be able to talk about just a student record, declare something as a student record. And somehow inside, it would have each of these different pieces of information or storage for each of these pieces of information. So once we've gone through and looked at how we can create these structs, we can create variables of these new data types, constants, parameters, anything that we like, and assign values to the different fields in any particular struct. So let's have a look at what that uh, looks like in practice. So the idea is we're creating a new data type. When we define a new form of struct, we're saying, for instance, a student record is going to have these kinds of pieces of information in it. So when I define a struct student record, I'm actually defining a new, data, a new data type. I'm saying when a student record gets created, it's going to have space for these kinds of information in it. So the example I've got here is using information about a product. And we'll keep it simple for now. And the only two pieces of information we're going to keep track of are the product's name and its price. So the keyword struct says I'm creating one of these new structs. I give my new definition and name. So product info, for instance. And again, this is going to be the name of a new data type. And inside one of these product info items, I'm going to have a name for the product that's a string, and I'm going to have a price for it that I'll represent as a float. So this is my definition of my new data type. All right, we're going through and saying a product info has a name and a price, and they're a string and a float, respectively then I can go through and quite happily declare variables that are of this new data type. So I can use product info as my, my data type and then create my variables x, y, and z, for instance. And each of those, x is going to have space inside it somewhere for a name and a price. y is going to have space inside it somewhere for a name and a price. And z is going to have space inside it somewhere for a name and a price. So each of these things has 
their own storage for their own name and their own price. Then when I want to refer to a specific name in a specific product, I use the variable name and then the field name, right? So if I want to refer to X's name, to the name that is stored in X, it's just X, the dot, and the name field, right? Whatever field I'm using here. So for instance, here, I'm assigning the string widget as the, the name for X's product information. And similarly, I could say X dot price is equal to 1999 or something like that. So we're now referring to individual fields by the variable name, the dot, and then the name of that field. And again, I can use it the same way I would use anything else of that particular data type. So X dot name is a string. X dot price is a float. Y dot name is a, a string. Y dot price is a float. So there's the, the basic syntax that we're going to play with. And again, if we wanted to try this out, I could say, let's create a product info item. Um, we'll call it P. So P is a variable. It's one of these product info things. You know, I ask the user to enter a product name and price, and then I read it in, right? Do a C in into P dot name, do a C in into P dot price. And again, those are just a string and a float. So C in knows how to handle it. I'm just telling it where that string is. It's in P and in the name field. And where that float is, it's in P in the price field. And we can just fill it in. Similarly, if I wanted to C out the same idea, well, yeah, probably should have used the same variable name here. C out, you know, P dot name. C out P dot price. Right. So again, we can use the individual fields just like a variable of that same data type. We just have to make sure that we specify which variable we're talking about and which field we're talking about. We can pass these things as parameters to functions. So let's say I wanted to have a function that was going to print the information about a single product. So the product would be one of these product info things. And you know, I'll give my parameter a name, prod or p or whatever it is you like. And inside, I'll say, OK, well, um, whatever you pass me, the item is, and you know, print out the product name, and its cost is you know, the product price. Then to actually call the print function and pass it a product, you, know, you could quite happily use something like print and just pass it whatever your variable name is, p, for instance, in our, uh, our product info from the previous page. And so we can go through and pass these structs off as parameters to a function. Now, as with most things in C++, everything we've looked at so far except arrays, it, uh, it does treat this as pass by value. So if we want the function to be able to change the contents, let's say if we want to come up with a fill function for our product, we need to make it pass by reference. So if I wanted a fill function where we're going to get the user to provide a name and a price, then it's still, you know, specify what kind of struct, the ampersand to make this pass by reference, whatever we want to call our parameter. And then, you know, you could prompt the user enter the product name and price, and then a C in into the product's name and into the product's price. And again, you can call the function normally, right? We're calling function fill and passing it whichever product we want filled in. So we can play with this stuff. We've got a way now to group together fields of uh, a variety of different data types and refer to them kind of logically as this, this higher level item. You know, I can think of things as, a, I can think of P as a product and just pass my product off to a function rather than having to pass all of the parameters individually, right? Rather than having to pass a name for my, a name parameter and a price parameter and a whatever else parameter, right? I just think of P as this single logical entity. And then inside the function, it worries about filling in the individual details. So maybe let's try uh, another example to just play with this a little bit more. So let's say, um, how about a, we'll do a points in the plane example. So let's 
So let's say I've got a two-dimensional graph, 2D graph, um, representing points. Yeah, representing points as x, y coordinates. So I could quite happily say, well, a point is going to be a struct, and I'm going to have, let's say, ints for x and y, right? The x, y coordinates of that particular point. I could come up with a function to display a point. Uh, why not? Let's call it display point. And so this is going to take a point as a parameter and print out the contents. Uh, let's kind of follow our standards a little bit here. So we'll have our main somewhere in the middle. So I want to be able to print out the contents of a point. And maybe what I'll do to actually print out the contents is to say, well, let's print the bracket, the points x value, the comma, and the points y value. And then I guess our closing bracket. So this is going to you know, display the point in the form, you know, x comma y. So we've got this function that can go through and display a point. Let's do another one to get a point. Oops. So for this one, we're going to get the user to provide us with the x and y coordinates, and we're going to fill in the point. So we'll make it pass by reference. say enter the x and y coordinates eg 10 20 and we'll just read them in to the x and y fields of our point and again we should really do error checking here but that's something you know how to do at this point. So we can go through, um, get the user to enter some coordinates, read them in to that point's X field and into that point's Y field. When we go to display it, we'll print out that point's X field and that point's Y field. And let's just give it a try. Let's create a point variable P and we'll Call get point to fill in a value for p, and we'll call display point to print out whatever's in p. And I've, all I've got display point doing is printing out the you know bracket x comma y and a bracket. So let's throw a little bit of uh, text around that. You know your point was. And maybe we'll throw a, a new line in afterwards so that our output is a little bit nicer. So, in theory, we've now got our main routine declares a point, gets the user to fill it in, and we print it back out for them. And again, we've got our point declared as just a couple of ints. And let's see if this actually compiles. Points.cpp, and I don't know, we'll call this ptx or something. Ooh, compiled, yay. And if we try running it, then it should ask me for my coordinates. So let's try, I don't know, 5 and 3. And my point was 5, 3. Right, so we get the idea. So we can now use these functions and structs to think of things logically as a point. Maybe I decide to take this one step further and let's get 
a whole collection of points. So let's get a points array now. And let's have some size. Um, I don't know, the number of points is... Well, I'm going to pick a small number because I'm going to run this in just a second. So we'll create an array now of this many points. All right, so now we've got an array of three elements. Each of those elements is a point. And so now what we'll do is let's say for i is 0, and well, i is less than the number of points. Now we'll go through and get three points and store them in the array, and we'll just keep calling get point to do it each time. And then let's do the same sort of thing. Uh, well, I'm going to be lazy. So we'll go through the array and print out each of those points. Now, when I'm calling it this time, I want to pass it the current array element. So I want to pass it some element in my points array. So in my points array, I want to fill in the ith point. Or when I'm displaying it in my points array, I want to print out the ith point. Let's just declare i once up here this time. So let's have our... So i is going to be the variable we use to step through the elements of the array. We'll have one loop that goes through getting our three points in this case, and then our second that goes through and prints out our three points. And let's see if we actually manage to compile this time. And uh, oh, I've got a typo in how I'm declaring these things. Um, I tried to create my array using the wrong name for the constant. All right, let's see. Oops, if that works out any better. Ah, we're getting closer. Okay. Oops. So, oh, how about for i is 0? Let's actually give i a value this time. Sounds like a good idea. And try compiling one more time. All right, we're making a little bit better practice. So let's run our point x. And hopefully this time it asks me for three points and then prints them back out. So ask the... Uh, enter the x and y coordinates for the first one, so let's say 1 and 2, I don't know, 20 and 5, negative 6 and 18, and yeah, it goes through and gives me back the, uh, the three different point values that I asked it to store. So we can come up with a um, now a way to go through and work with these collections of values of a variety of types if we want. You know, if I want to get fancier, I could give my points names. All right, so let's add our string class here. And so now, now whenever I get a point or print a point, I want to have a name included in that. Now, my main routine doesn't need to change at all. As far as my main routine is concerned, it's got a bunch of points, and it's just saying, please go get me the information for the current point. Please print out the information for the current point. So my main routine can stay exactly the same. My function prototypes stay the same. All that has to happen is inside my display point, I now want to print the name. So let's print the uh, points name and I don't know maybe we'll uh, so now it's gonna come out in the form some name and then the XY and 
in our get point, we'll also ask them to enter the name. Enter the point name. And we'll read that in. So again, we can start making these fields fan or the uh, our structs fancier if we like. And hopefully I haven't messed anything up here. And now I can go through and say, I don't know, point one at one, two, point two at ten five, point three at negative one, negative two. And sure enough, it goes through and tells me the point names and the associated x and y values. So we can play with this a fair bit and we can start developing more and more complex structures. All right, let's get back to our discussions here. So as you've seen, we can go through and start creating these arrays of structs. So whatever data type you're interested in and whatever name you want to give your array and whatever size you want to give it, and each element of the array is now one of these structs. So for instance, in the product info case, each element of the array would have a name and a price. So I can happily go through and you know, have some kind of a loop that says for every element of the array, in that element, so in the ith element, fill in the name. In the ith element, fill in the price. Right? So now you're using this syntax where we're saying, let's refer to the name of the array, which element we're interested in, and then the dot, and which field we're interested in for that element. And again, as we've seen in that, um, in other examples, we can go through and pass arrays as parameters, where you pass the, uh, you know, come up with a name for your, your parameter, the open and close square brackets, something to indicate the size of it. All right, so here we're passing an array of these product info strike structs. And inside, we'll do the exact sort of thing that we did on that previous slide, where we say, let's go through and fill in all the products for this particular case. So we'll take this array, and for each element, we'll fill in the name and price. So for, oops, that should actually be num. Those things should match, right? So for whatever uh, our array size is, we want to go through and fill in for the ith element, the name, and for the ith element, the price. And again, your call would just be calling your fill products function, passing it the name of your array, and passing it the size that you want it to use. So similarly, we could go through and you know maybe create a function to go through and search our array. So let's say we've got an array of products. Maybe this represents our inventory, for instance. So the store inventory has got you know 500 different products listed in it. And we want to go in and look up the price of one specific product. So maybe somebody passes us the name of the product that we want to look up. And we want to go through this array, see if we can find one of these product items that has that as the name field, and then print uh, uh, maybe return the position. Say, OK, I found the product with that name in position three in the array or in position 70 of the array. And so same sort of idea. We'll just go through each position of the array the same way we would normally, right? For each position in the array, we're just saying for the element in that position, look at the name field and see if it matches the target that we're looking for. If so, then we found a match and we can return the current position. And if we get all the way through the array and we never found it, then at the end, we can return negative one, right? Indicating we didn't find it. But again, it's gonna be fairly common for us to pass individual structs to a function to either modify or do something with, or to pass entire arrays of structs off to a function and let the function go through the entire array and do something with all of them or search it for one in particular. Now, the beauty of structs is it gives us a way to abstract away more complex items into simpler parts. So if I want to think of a product as having a bunch of information associated with it, but 
I can think of it when I want to as just a product. Right? When I'm thinking of it as a product, I, ne I don't need to worry about all the individual fields that are inside, like we saw with the points. Right? My main routine didn't care what kinds of fields were inside a point. It just called the function and said, here, go fill in the information for a product. Here, or for a point, rather. Here, go f display the information for a product. Right? So at a high level, say at the main routine level, all we're thinking about is the big item. And then in the functions that manipulate it, those can focus on the specific individual fields that belong to that kind of item. But they don't have to worry about how you're using the, the big item, if you like. So again, for instance, in our product example, if our main routine wanted to create a product, fill it in, and print it, again, all that has to think about is the name for our product type, so product info, for instance, call the function, pass it our product, call a function, pass it our product. It doesn't need to know about the gory details, and the gory details can change. Again, I could add new fields to a product info, and my main routine wouldn't change at all. The insides of the fill routine would change, and the insides of the print routine would change, because they need to know about the pieces that are inside a product. But the things that are treating it, treating P as just a product, don't need to worry about the gory details. And that's the beauty of this kind of abstraction approach or abstraction concept. Now, this gets even nicer when we start creating these hierarchies of logical data entities. So let's consider a case where we're looking at information about a, a class, uh, as in a, a group of students. <laughs> so let's say we've got information we want to keep track of for individual students, and then information we want to keep track of for a course as a whole. So relative to a, a particular course, for a student, we might want to keep track of their name and how many labs they've turned in and what marks they got in the labs. So for a student, we could go through and create a struct that said, okay, well, a student's going to have a name field, that's going to be a string, they're going to, be ha they're going to have an array of floats to represent the marks they got on their labs, and maybe an int to keep track of how many labs they completed. And then for a course, we might want to keep information like the uh, maybe the name of the course, the name of the instructor, how many students are in the course, and then information about the specific students. So we might have an array of student. right? So each element of the array is information about one student. So each element of that array is going to have all of this stuff inside it somehow, right? Each element of my array of students is going to be one single student. So now I've got this much more complex structure where a course actually represents, it's got fields for all sorts of different pieces of information. One of those is an array of structs that's information about individual students. Right? So if I created an item of type course, it would have a string for the instructor, an int for the number of students, and it would have an array of 60 elements where each of those elements had a string for the name, an int for the number of labs, and an array of 10 floats as part of that element. Now, we could work with these things directly. We could go through and say something like, if I wanted to assign a particular value for the, you know, the 10th student and their fifth lab, I could go through and say, well, please enter the mark for, you know, uh, lab five for a student. And, you know, I could look up and say, well, if this is my course, so if I've got, if info 160 is my, my course variable, then I'd say, well, in info 160, in the students field, I want to look up, let's say the 10th student and in particular their name field. So you can go through and say, well, the variable name, the dot, which field we're interested in, and since it's an array, which element of the array we want. And then since that element is itself a struct, a dot, and then which field we want in that. So you can access this stuff directly if you want to. Similarly, if we're asking them to enter a mark for a particular lab, then we could turn around and do a C in and you know they enter 9.5 or something like that. And we say, okay, that's going into you know my 
variable for the course, the dot, the students field for that particular item. Since the students field is an array, we want to specify you know, which element of the array. And since that contains, since that is a struct, we want to specify which field, so a dot, and we want to get at the marks field, but the marks field is also an array, so we need to specify which element of that. So again, you can go through and directly access anything kind of deep down in our struct of structs of structs of structs of arrays of structs of whatever they happen to be. Right? You just have to kind of think about the sequence logically. But as you can see, it does get it does start getting a little confusing and a little awkward, and it's easy to make mistakes when you're doing this kind of thing. So it's much more normal for us to start writing functions that work on a course and functions that work on a student. And the function that worked on a course might call the function that worked on a student. So for instance, let's say if we wanted to fill in information about a student, we would have a function that would you know, take a, a single student struct as a pass by reference parameter and go off and fill it in. If we wanted a function that would fill in information about a course, you know, we would pass it our course variable, you know, pass by reference, so it can fill that in. And the fill for the course is going to go off and call the fill for a student a bunch of times. You know, if there's 10 students to fill in, it's going to call that once for each of the 10 students. So as far as my main routine is concerned, it creates the variable for the course, so info160 for instance, and then just calls that high level one, says please fill in you know, all the information for 160, and it leaves the gory details up to that particular function. So if we were gonna try and implement these, again, the one for a student is pretty straightforward, right? This is the kind of thing we've seen already. You know, enter a student name, and we'll fill in the name in the s.name field. Enter the number of labs they've done, so we'll fill in the s.number of labs field. It's got an array of floats for the specific lab marks. So again, we could have a, a loop that just went through and said, okay, well, for each element of the array, read the current mark into the ith element of that array. So the students one isn't too bad. Then the course one doesn't need to worry about the gory details of what's inside a student because it's going to call fill for the student to get, take care of all that. So for the course one, we just said, well, enter the instructor name and fill that in, right, in C's instructor field. Tell us how many students there are. Fill in the C.num students field. And then for each of those students, so we've got that array of students, we'll just say, well, pass the ith element off to the fill function for a student and let it worry about filling in the gory details. So we no longer need to worry about those kind of layers upon layers upon layers of access to the individual fields. So this is where the, the beauty of the abstraction comes in. I can write functions that are just focusing on the kind of item I'm interested in right now, and it only worries about the fields for that kind of item. Right? We rely on other functions to fill in the gory details for the nested internal pieces. All right, that might be where we leave that one for now. We will get lots of practice with our structs, and these same concepts are going to come back uh, quite a bit when we get into classes later on. But we will leave that there for now.